Hey guys, in the previous video I showed you how to solve a problem where we've got a bar like this and we're asked to find the angular velocity of this bar when it swings down to its vertical position assuming it's released from rest. And to do this problem this time, I'm going to use energy methods just like I did last time but with a minor twist. So we know if we're using energy methods we're going to use the change in mechanical energy is equal to the work done by non-conservative forces. And if you simplify that out, that's the change in kinetic energy plus the change in potential energy is equal to the work done by non-conservative forces. And if you expand this out once more, and in a test you could probably just cut to this final line, that's going to be a half m v2 squared minus v1 squared plus a half i omega 2 squared minus omega 1 squared plus a half k x2 squared minus x1 squared plus mg h2 minus h1 is going to be equal to your work done by non-conservative forces. Wow, that is a long equation to write out every single time. Um, I, would, I would still recommend you do it just because it helps you remember the formula, but I wouldn't be worried about this entire equation because a lot of it will simplify out as you're about to see. Okay, well first of all we know this term right here is going to be equal to zero. That's because the change in elastic energy is equal to zero, um, which um, which, is, which is definitely the case because we're dealing with no springs or compressible objects. <clears throat> Not only that, but um, the work done by non-conservative forces is going to be equal to zero. And to understand why, let us draw a free body diagram. This is going to be the free body diagram of our bar in its initial case when it's released from rest, the moment after it's released from rest. We're going to have, let's see, mg downwards just here. And because this is a pin support just here, we're going to have r y just here and r x just here okay and let's actually superimpose what our object looks like at our second case so it's going to look like this this is at our second state just here okay um notice i should actually draw mg downwards at this point just here <clears throat> Okay, so in order to figure out the work done by non-conservative forces, we need to identify what the non-conservative forces are. Bingo, they're Rx and Ry. But the work done by these two forces are zero, are zero, because these forces do not move the pin. That's because the pin's stuck where it is. So although these forces um, are definitely positive, that word, like they do exist, they do not move the pin, therefore the work done by them is zero. All right, so let's rewrite what we've got now really quick. We're left with a half m v2 squared minus v1 squared plus a half i omega 2 squared minus omega 1 squared, let's see, plus mg h2 minus h1 is equal to zero. Okay, it's already simplified out quite a bit. Now let's figure out what delta h is, this term right here. Basically how much it's fallen well, in order to do this, let's actually think about what the center of mass does when it's swooping out this particular type of path. Well, it's going to be a circular path, isn't it? It's got a fixed radius. So this will be a circle I'm drawing right here. This is the path of your center of mass just here. The path isn't too important. What is important is the fact that it's dropped down a distance L on 2 just here. It's dropped downwards an L, a distance L on 2, meaning delta H is going to be equal to minus L on 2. Okay, so let's actually rewrite that, knowing what we've kn knowing exactly what I mentioned here, um, meaning that that's going to be a half m v two squared minus v one squared plus a half i omega two squared minus omega one squared minus. Actually, I'll just do it on. I'll put this on the right hand side. It's going to be equal to m g l on two. Cool. M g l on two. Fantastic. Now let's talk about what these omega terms and what these v terms even mean. I'm going to be viewing this problem as rotating around the center of mass. This is where I differ from the previous problem. I'm going to view this entire bar as rotating around the center of mass. So if you think about it, think about this entire bar rotating around the center of mass. This will be how it is right now, then this is what it will be by later, etc, etc, etc. That does not fully describe the phenomenon we're observing. Notice that it really truly rotates only around our point O, our pin support just here. So if I wanted to view this particular problem as rotating around our center of mass, I would also need to account for the translation of our center of mass.
So basically, that means I cannot isolate, I cannot get rid of either of these terms if I view this as rotating around point G. In fact, we can rewrite this now as a half m times v2g, the velocity of our center of mass at our second point squared, minus v1g squared, plus a half ig, so that's the moment of inertia around our point g, times by omega 2 squared minus omega 1 squared, and that's going to be equal to mgl on 2. Notice the way you view the problem changes the way you um, alter your algebra. It changes the values you put in, although I should tell you that the answer will be the exact same. Um, so let's, let's think about this. If the bar is released from rest, that means the angular velocity is going to be equal to zero at its first state. So this is going to be equal to zero. It also implies that the velocity of our center of mass at its first state is going to be equal to zero as well. So these two terms are zero. So let's rewrite what we've got. We're left with a half m v2g squared plus a half ig omega 2 squared is equal to mgl on 2. Cool, but we've got two unknowns in one equation, so we need a way to put v2g in terms of omega 2. And the easiest way to do this, in fact the only way to do this, is using circular motion. So notice the, mo the, pos the path that the center of mass undergoes will be circular. That's because it's got a fixed radius of l on 2. It's got a fixed radius of l on 2. Which means then that the velocity at the second point of your center of mass, v2g, due to our circular motion video, is going to be equal to r, which is l on 2, times by omega at that corresponding value, which is omega 2. Right? And that's because this is a constant radius just here, and this right here has been derived in a previous video. Okay, guys, um, now we can substitute that back into our equation just here, and we're left with a half m times by l on 2 omega 2 squared plus a half ig. Now, the moment of inertia about a, about a rod that's rotating around its center of mass is just i center of mass, in this case, ig, is going to be equal to 1 on 12 ml squared. That's a good formula to remember, but I've also derived that in a previous video. So let's write that in. It's going to be one tw a half times by 1 12th ml squared times by omega 2 squared, and that's going to be equal to mgl on 2. Cool, let's just rush through the algebra because I'm sure we're all pretty good at this. So this is going to be omega 2 squared times by a half m times by l on 2 squared, which is l squared on 4, plus, if you simplify this out, it's going to be ml squared on 24, so that's these two terms taken care of, and the right-hand side remains how it was, mgl on 2. And when you rush through this, you're left with omega 2 squared times by ml squared on 8 plus ml squared on 24 is equal to mgl on 2. Cool. And let's multiply both sides by 24. I feel like that's the best, that's the best way to go. Let's see how many 8s go into 24. It'll be 3. So that'll be 3ml squared plus ml squared is equal to, what's uh, 24 divided by 2? It's 12 mgl. And uh, simplifying that more, that's omega 2 squared times by, oh, that's nice, it's going to be 4 ml squared is equal to 12 mgl. And I'll just write it over here for effect. That means omega 2 squared is going to be equal to 12 mgl over 4 ml squared, meaning that omega 2, noticing that this can actually I'll write another step that's equal to uh, 3 that cancels off that cancels off 3g on L yeah so that means omega 2 is going to be equal to the square root of 3g on L cool we're, unfortunately we're not given the direction um, that's always the case with these energy methods however you can use common sense to realize that if this block is swinging this way that means that omega 2 is actually going to be in the clockwise direction okay guys that's the answer i really hope that makes sense and uh i'm going to do the method three now